Church, if you are there, I said, Praise the Lord. I pray that the love of God will flow through the heart of everyone in Jesus' name. His love and mercy will flow through us. His grace will flow through us. And His love abiding will flow through us. And the blessings of the Lord will enrich every life in Jesus' name. Your amen is as weak as my voice. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for what you've been doing for us since we came the first night of the retreat. And thank you for the blessings of every day. Thank you for the goodness that will shower upon your people. And we're asking, Lord, that tonight you shower more upon us in Jesus' name. Everything we should have got, we will get. Everything you have ordained will receive, we are going to receive. And everything you have planned that this retreat will accomplish in every life will be accomplished in Jesus' name. Nothing will cut short our blessing. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Tonight, we are going to do something as the Lord is leading, as the Lord gives the strength. I told you last night about digging deep. I'm going to give a message now, which you should have heard in the morning. Because everything God has for you, you are going to get and then after that as the Lord gives strength say the Lord will give strength I'll then go with you to a digging deep session today something must happen in your life but coming to this message now the futility of hope without holiness the futility the failure the disappointment of hope without holiness i'm coming to psalm 93 verse 5 thy testimonies are very sure holiness becometh thy house O lord forever here the psalmist is reminding us that God is high and holy, that God is heavenly, because of that is holy. His heaven, which is his first house, his eternal house, where he had been from all eternity, that house in heaven is holy. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, from everlasting to everlasting. And then he comes here on earth and will build a sanctuary for him. The sanctuary will build for him on earth a place of worship, a temple. That temple, holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Then he brings us to himself. We become the temple of God, the children of God. You remember Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. He's standing at the door of your heart. If anyone opens the door, I will come in unto him and I will fellowship with him. I will sup with him. When he enters into us, we become the temple of God and we become the house of God. The testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. That means that you, as a child of God, you, as the temple of God, God dwells in you. And because He dwells in you, you are the house of God. And holiness becomes your house. Every room in your house, every room in your temple, 
your heart the very center your spirit that gives you the ability to do what you are doing your mind your emotion your speech your thought everything in the house of god that is in your temple holiness becomes thy house O lord forever and it says when christ comes into you and holiness becomes your house he says it is now to be there forever he wants holiness not only on sunday he wants holiness not only in the local sanctuary he wants holiness anywhere you find yourself in your house in your community in your office you are the house of god and you're moving about holiness becomes thy house O lord forever when you were young in the faith you came to the lord and the lord now abides in you and he says at that young age when you were new convert holiness becomes thine house and now you are growing in the lord and you can be counting years i've come to the lord for 20 years for 30 years but you understand it is holiness is not something you say i have outgrown that now i can drop that now it says holiness becometh thy household lord tell me how long forever at the retreat outside the retreat with your friends, with your neighbors, with co-workers in the office, in the private, in the public, anywhere you find yourself, holiness becomes thy house, O oh Lord, forever. The many people that do not know that, I don't mean you, I mean many people in the world, in the church world, many people in the denominational religious assembly, they do not understand that and so it makes them something more than or apart from being holy i'm reading to you from job chapter 11 job chapter 11 and we're reading from verse 20 job 11 verse 20 but the eyes of the wicked shall fail now it doesn't talk about the location of that wicked man or the stature of that wicked man or the background of that wicked man or the company of that wicked man or the connections earthly connections of that wicked man wherever that wicked man is the wicked man comes to the sanctuary and retains his wickedness the wicked man goes to a synagogue or he goes to a cathedral and retains his wickedness and the wicked man comes to deep and life retreat and retains the wickedness no matter the location of the wicked man no matter the stature of the wicked man and no matter the financial standing of that wicked man the eyes of the wicked shall fail and they shall not escape you see you cannot bribe god and you cannot appease god with material things or with whatever position you have if you are a wicked man and you have not repented whatever you do the judgment will still come and it says they shall not escape their hope shall be as a giving up of the ghost the futility of hope without holiness if our hope is going to make any meaning if our hope is going to attract any recognition from god that hope must be linked with holiness but if it is hope and hypocrisy hope and wickedness hope and sinfulness that will attract the judgment of god hope without holiness is fertile it's a waste it's totally unacceptable in the sight of the lord three things we're going to concern number one the fatal deception of the hope of hypocrites the deception but that deception is fatal the fatal deception of the hope of hypocrites number two the future destiny through hope with holiness you have hope in the lord and every man that has this hope in him 
purify themselves even as he is pure and you allow your hope to lead to holiness in your life there's a future destiny through hope with holiness number three the fixed direction of hope towards heaven a person is going to go to heaven on a journey in that journey you keep on looking at the place you are going you'll not turn to the left you'll not turn to the right you are looking at the place you are going and you're focused on heaven in your place of work you're focused on heaven anything you are called to do in your community you are focused on heaven and when you interact with your friends or you interact with your neighbors or you interact with anyone even a stranger in your mind you understand that holiness befits and becomes and is suitable for the house of the lord forever and it is because of that you fix your attention and you fix your gaze and you fix your direction on the path of holiness there will not be a time when you'll say i don't think i'm going to be holy today i don't think i'm going to be righteous today the pressure today is so much the difficulty today is so much the challenges of today are so much and therefore i say i'm going to take vacation from holiness today there's no vacation from holiness because holiness becomes thine house tell me how long tell me how long holiness becomes thy house forever and that's what the lord is reminding us if holiness becomes the house of the lord forever it means then your destiny and your destination is determined by the direction you are going and you fix that direction and you say i will never move i will never change and i will never go astray left or right i am going to remain holy somebody there you remain holy yeah. the fixed direction of hope towards heaven point number one is the fatal deception the fatal deception the deadly deception the dangerous deception the destructive deception of hope the hope of the hypocrites who are coming to job chapter 20 job chapter 20 and i'm reading from verse 4 job chapter 20 verse 4 it says knowest thou not this of old since man was placed upon us that the triumphing of the wicked is short the triumphing of the sinner is short the triumphing of the righteous is short it might appear that the wicked the sinner the unconverted that is making progress and that is moving on and you think they're triumphing they're making it and yet they are not righteous it says it is short it is for a short time and then it says the joy that's the second part of verse 5 the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment the joy of the hypocrite the success of the hypocrite the happiness of the hypocrite is but for a moment it says though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach unto the clouds yet he shall perish forever like his own dawn they which have seen him shall say where is he because they will not see him anymore because they will not see the joy the excitement and the life that he portrayed when he was high up maybe in achievement because the wickedness brings him down tells us in job chapter 27 job chapter 27 and i'm reading from verse 8 in job chapter 27 verse 8 for what is the hope 
of the hypocrite. He stays in the church and is a hypocrite. He appears religious, but he's a hypocrite. He claims to be righteous when he talks to people, when he interacts with people, but he's a hypocrite. And it says in that verse 8 that that hypocrite has no hope that is sustaining, has no hope that is constant. It says, though he has gained, when God takes away his soul, what will be his soul? Will God hear his cry when trouble comes upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call upon God? He's telling us of the triumphing of the wicked and the triumphing of uh, the hypocrite that saw so vain and fertile. In Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 11, reading here from verse 7. Proverbs chapter 11. Reading from verse 7, it says, When a wicked man dies, his expectation shall perish, his hope shall perish, his plans shall perish. And all the things he said, I'll get there, I'll go there, I'll get this, I'll get that. When that wicked man, when God takes away his life, that hypocrite, when God takes away his life, that perpetual sinner, habitual sinner, and that wicked man, criminal, when God takes away his life, it says the hope is gone. The expectation is gone. And the hope of the unjust man perishes. The hope of unjust man perishes. The righteous is delivered out of trouble. But the, and the wicked cometh in his stage, and hypocrite with his mouth, what does he do? Destroys his neighbor. A hypocrite, a church man, a church woman, even a worker, so to say, in a church, and yet because it's a hypocrite, the religion doesn't go beyond the talk of the mouth. The religion doesn't reach deep in the heart and touch the heart and turn the heart and transform the heart and make him a new creature in Christ. It's just religion, superficial religion. And it doesn't go to the depths of the heart of the man. It says over here that that hypocrite who is religious but not righteous, that hypocrite who is superficial in his worship, he destroys his neighbor with his mouth. And through knowledge shall the just be delivered. If you are a righteous person and you are hoping in the Lord and you are standing on the promises of God, you'll be delivered in Jesus' name. Job chapter 8. And I'm reading here from verse 13, Job chapter 8, and we're reading from verse 13. The hypocrite has no lively hope. The hypocrite has no sustaining hope. The hypocrite does not have a hope that will be made effective and made real on the final day. Job chapter 8. Verse 13, so are the parts of all that forget God. Forget God. And the hypocrite's hope shall perish. It's reminding us over and over, it's fatal to be a hypocrite. It's dangerous to be a hypocrite. It's deadly to be a hypocrite. It says so at the ways of all that forget God and the hypocrite's hope shall perish whose hope shall be cut off those who are not saved those who are not born again and they are just uh, trying to ride on the waves of their emotion when they are religiously excited and they ride on the wings of deception 
and they quote the promises of God. This is mine and that is mine. It's yours only if you're a child of God. It's yours only if you have been set free from the sins that bind your life. It is yours only if hypocrisy is gone and you have a lively hope in Christ. It says whose hope shall be cut off and whose trust shall be a spider's web. That means that thing cannot hold. Your hope will hold in Jesus' name. Let the church say an exciting amen. amen. Jeremiah chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 17. I'm reading here from verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cause it be the man that trusteth a man. How is that? There are people that claim to be religious. They don't have an iota of trust in God. They go to church. When they come out of church, any problem that happens, they say, how at least they are running to. They go to church and they might even take communion. And when they come out of that communion, any challenge that comes to them, there's an occultic man they're going to run to. And they go to church, they read the Bible, they read the prayer book, and they sing the songs. Maybe they have been baptized even in infancy or maybe in adulthood. And yet, in all their lives, they do not have a real trust in the Lord. And it says, if they are like that, I pray you'll not be like that. You know, somebody comes to a retreat, and then after the retreat, it still goes back to the shrine. It still goes back to the false prophet, because his hope is not in God. His confidence is not in God. His reliance is not in God. And he never prays. He might pray while we're here. Or if he's really pushed to the wall, he might open a prayer book. And when this happens, read this one seven times. When this happens, pray this prayer 21 times. Maybe that's what he does. But he cannot speak like a child to his father. He cannot speak like a child to a father who is in heaven. He trusts in men. His mind is on men. Everything he wants to get, everything he hopes to get, he hopes to get it from man. He doesn't believe that God can directly bless his life. Look at that. Thus says the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth a man and maketh flesh his arm. Make his flesh his support. Make his flesh his, uh, his goodness. And it says, whose heart departs from the Lord. The heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like the hairs in the desert. And shall not see when good cometh. Because it's not trusting God. It's not relying on God. And because it's not relying on God, he will not see when the goodness of God that comes with the gospel, when it comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. On the other hand, uh, when you are a child of God. On the other hand, when your hope is in God. On the other hand, when you're trusting, a young trusting man. On the other hand, when you put all your confidence, all your faith, all your trust, all your reliance, all your assurance, everything you're asking for, you're putting your trust in God. Look at what happens. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord whose hope the Lord is. Believers have challenges, but they put their hope in Christ. Believers have difficulties, but they who put their hope in Christ, they put their trust in Christ. And it says, they are blessed, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river. And shall not see when heat cometh, but her liver shall be green. Looks like he's talking about me. I said he's talking about me. Your leaves shall be green. And shall not be anxious, shall not be careful, 
shall not be frightened, shall not be fearful, shall not panic in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. And then he says in verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. You cannot know your heart if you are not born again. If Christ has not come in, you cannot know this is the real stage of my heart, whether carnal or spiritual, whether fleshly, natural, or supernatural. It's only when Christ comes in, then it says he will be the one to search the heart. But verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it i the lord search the heart i try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing i pray we will not be hypocrites i will not be a hypocrite what I do in public, I do in private. Uh-huh, I caught you. What I am in church, I am at home. What I am in church, I am in the office. What I say, I believe publicly. I believe privately. Where I stand, I always stand. You will not be a hypocrite. Matthew chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. You see, the hypocrites. They omit the weightier matters of the law. And what are those weightier matters of the law? Justice, judgment, that means righteousness. Mercy, that means going doing good to other people. And faith, faith in the Lord. Confidence in the Lord. Relying on the Lord every time. With all your heart, with all your soul. And with all your mind, but you see these hypocrites, they omit the weightier matters of the law. There's no justice, there is no impartiality, and there is no sincerity, and there is no faithfulness, because all they want are paid my tithes, I've given the money, and the preacher, the pastor, the priest has said, well done. They get well done from man, but they don't have it well done from the heavenly father. It says they're hypocrites. They omit the weightier matters of the law, justice, righteousness, mercy, and faith, faithfulness. These ought ye to have done and not to have left the others undone. Look at verse 25. One to you, scribes, and Pharisees, hypocrites. You know, the Lord always spoke against hypocrisy because he's a two faced person. It's a person that is facing this side on Sunday and he dresses well, dresses in white, and there's no stain on his white dress. But then let him come out of church. And then he faces the world. It's all black. The whitish color is gone. And the whitish behavior is gone. It's only religious. It's a put on. But now, when he goes outside, it's all unclean. Want to use scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye make clean the outside of the cup. And of the platter, but within a full of extortion and excess, the blind Pharisee cleansed first that 
which is within the core and the platter that the outside of them may be clean also unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites can you think of jesus christ always saying blessed blessed at those that mourn they'll be comforted always saying blessed blessed at the peacemakers because they'll become the children of god can you pick to jesus christ blessed at those who thirst and hunger after righteousness because they shall be filled can you think of jesus always saying blessed at the pure in heart for they shall see god but he turns around and he looks around him and he sees hypocrites pharisees and Sadducees and now he says woe unto you instead of saying blessed he says woe to the scribes to the Pharisees hypocrites for ye are like unto whited sepulchres which indeed appear beautiful outward but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness even so he also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Hypocrisy and iniquity. Whatever profession of righteousness, it does external. It doesn't go deep. It's not in their heart. It's not in their lives. And it says, all that external sin, notwithstanding, deep in their hearts they have hypocrisy and iniquity what's the result of that verse 33 in verse 33 is serpents you know serpents serpents that crawl in the green grass and you cannot detect serpents that will come and if you're not conscious you'll not even know that any, anything is going on at all it says you serpents the people don't see you and the people don't know you and the people don't know your lifestyle you serpents, see hypocrites you generation of vipers how can you escape the damnation of hell you'll escape hell in jesus name but you must come out of all hypocrisy whatever you are outside the righteous be like that inside whatever you are on sunday and you're giving your heart to the Lord and singing to the Lord and worshiping the Lord be like that during the week whatever you are when members of the church are around you say I cannot do that I cannot do that I cannot say that because members of the church are around when the members of the church are not around and you're all alone by yourself to say that we're children of God and we practice holiness means when people are not there, we're still going to live the life that a child of God ought to live. We're looking at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 16. Luke chapter 12. The fatal deception of the hope of hypocrites. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my goods, my fruits. And he said, This what shall I, will I do? I will pull down my pants and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods and I will say to my soul soul thou hast much goods laid up for many years take thine ease eat drink and be merry that's what the people of the world call success success without salvation this is what they say will give them happiness 
I've gotten this, I've gotten this, I've gotten that. Bank account here in Nigeria, bank account overseas. Houses here in Nigeria, houses almost in every part of Nigeria, in the north, at the capital here in Lagos, and then in the east, I've got houses there. Here is what they call achievement without salvation. Here is what they call success. Here is what they call making it. They said that man has made it. If you follow him there, he's not in need of anything. Anywhere he goes, he has an account he can withdraw from and he's not in need of anything at all. And so he says in verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You go to such a person, you're talking about being born again. You go to such a person and you're inviting them to come and hear the word of God. They look at you from the top to the bottom, from the head uh, to your toe. And they look at your dress and they put their hand in their pockets and they give you maybe 5,000 naira. They say, hey, go and spend this one. You know, church, what am I going to look for? All you people that go to church, you're looking for money, I've got it. You're looking for land, I've got it. You're looking for house, I've got it. You're looking for property, I've got it. So what am I going to church for? They don't understand that money does not satisfy the soul. They don't understand that sand and cement will not settle you and build a mansion for you up on high. And so the man said, I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid off for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, what will God say unto you? I've got this. What will God say unto you? I belong to this church. What will God say unto you? I worship. What will God say unto you? I'm sacrificially giving everything I've got. That's not the important thing. What will God say unto you? I'm rich. I have need of nothing. I have all the clothes and all the fashions you could think about in the world. That's not the point. What will God say unto you? But God said unto him, thou fool, thou fool. A rich man, thou fool. Educated man, thou fool. Highly placed man, thou fool. A person that had more than enough of these world's material things, thou fool. It says, uh, God said, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? You cannot take one naira out of a billion naira that you have. You cannot take one naira out and get beyond the grave. It's useless. All the, all the houses. You cannot take the title deeds. You cannot take anything away because at that time when God says, come over, you leave everything behind. You know, somebody died and another person was asking, how much did he leave behind? They said, oh, why are you asking? He left all. He left all behind. And the people who are chasing shadows, those who are chasing the mirage of life and they want to be here, they want to be here, they want to be there. All they're looking for is what eyes can see. They want to build that and that's my house and that's my mansion. That's this and that's that. It says when you are to be carried out of that house, who shall do this be that you have labored for? And it says so. Is he that lays up treasure for himself? And is not rich towards God. I pray that you will not be your Lord. You will not die inside money, and yet you don't have a mansion in heaven. You will not die inside riches and wealth, and yet you do not have a place in heaven. You will not die popular here on earth, and then in heaven nobody knows you. 
you give your life to the Lord. You surrender completely to the Lord. And then in your mind, there's no hypocrisy, but holiness unto the Lord forever and ever. I come to point number two, the future destiny through hope with holiness. Hope does not stand alone. Hope cannot be isolated. I have hope, I have hope. What's the ground of your hope? What's the basis of your hope? What's the foundation of your hope? The hope must be anchored in Christ. That hope must have salvation as the foundation. And that hope must have holiness as the backbone that makes that hope stand. The future destiny through hope with holiness we're coming back to psalm 93 psalm 93 and i'm reading from verse 4 psalm 93 verse 4 the lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters yea than the mighty waves of the sea that testimonies are very sure Holiness becometh thy house. Holiness befeeds thy house. Holiness is essential for thy house. Holiness is indispensable for thy house, O Lord, forever. God is not a vacillating God, and his desire, his demand is not fluctuating. It's not that he, he accepted and he demanded holiness from Israel, but for the Gentiles, he says, you can live the way you want. Nothing else is required of you. Just say, God is my God, and then you can follow your idolatry. Nothing like that. Anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord, holiness becomes thine house, O Lord. How long? Psalm 110. Psalm 110. I'm reading from verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. It was said to the Lord by the Heavenly Father, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Look at verse 3. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. What does that mean? Your people will be willing to follow you in the day of your power. If they see your power, they will be willing to come out of Egypt. If they see your power, They'll be willing to walk in the narrow path that leads to the promised land. Your people shall be willing. They'll be willing to serve you. If they see your power dividing the Red Sea, your people shall be willing. They'll be willing to bench and bow under your law when they see the manifestation of your power. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness. Not the beauties of makeup. In the beauties of holiness. It's not the beauty of worldliness. It is in the beauty of holiness. I want you to imagine, you know, you are, you are going to church. And you are spending one hour before the mirror. Okay, you say, I don't spend one hour before the mirror. I about 30 minutes before the mirror. And then there's another mirror inside your bag. And once in a while, you look at that mirror to see your facial expression. And then to order your hair this way and that way, you look at that mirror more than you look at the Bible. And it says... What God is interested in is not the beauty we'll catch on the mirror. It is the beauty of holiness. And if you, whatever beauty you have, if holiness is not in your heart, 
God does not recognize that beauty. It says, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Isaiah chapter 33. And here I'm reading from verse 14. Isaiah chapter 33. And we're reading from verse 14. Here in verse 14 of Isaiah chapter 33, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Zion? How could there be sinners in Zion? You remember when David committed adultery? He was living in Zion? He was in Zion? And you remember all those people that live around the palace of the king? When he sent them, go and bring that woman, those who are running errands of defilement, errands of sinfulness. It was in, we were living in Zion. There are sinners that may be at the very center of the sanctuary. The hypocrites. If they die in that condition, as sinners in Zion, as sinners in the temple, as sinners in the tabernacle of the Lord, when the judgment of God comes, they'll be afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire, who among us shall dwell with everlasting bunnies. But now he turns around and he talks about the so holy. And those who are righteous, and it says in verse 15, He that walketh righteously, walketh, walketh. It's not something I do it retreat time, and then when I get back home, I go back to my simple self. Not at all. He that walketh righteously, consistent walking, daily walking, moment by moment walking in righteousness and speaketh uprightly does not say something out and has nothing in the heart does not tell you something and then you are running over that thing and he's looking at you and shaking his head and saying i pity the man look at what i told him he didn't know that i just told him that and he's running already you know when a believer tells you something he says to the believer you cannot run with it why about that? It tells you something, you cannot build on it. It tells you something, you cannot stake your life on it. A believer told me this, and I'm willing to stake my life on that. And then the so-called believer is looking at you and shaking his head. He said, this one is dumb. This one is, you know, is senseless because I told him that he took you for your word. He thought you were a believer. If you are a believer, you will speak the truth in your mouth. You are not believing a life of expediency. This is expedient. This will achieve my goal. This will make me happy. What makes the other fellow unhappy? A real believer is on his way to heaven. It says, he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, that despises the gain of oppression, that despises the gain of oppression. This economic time, this time of economy, is when we know true believers. You know, you, you have a need. And you know this man, your neighbor, your community, during the day, it's always around. It's like he doesn't have any work, but he has this car, he has this car, he has that car. And then he throws money everywhere. And you're wondering, what work is he doing? And now you have a need. You want to pay for house rent, or you want your house finance for sending your child to school and you see that your child has been at home all the time and he's passing by and he is a rich man he calls you he says uh, what's happening to your child your child is not going to school and then you to start with 
you just say, well, it's a personal thing. It's between me and God, and let him go his way. But to begin to tell a story, actually, we couldn't pay the school fees. Ah, what do you need to tell us? We're here. We're neighbors. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this man that you know, he doesn't have a regular work he's doing. How you see getting his riches. There are so-called believers that will not think of that. And they get thousands of naira millions from people that are of dubious character. If we're going to get to heaven, all that will repent of. We're building a church. And then uh, somebody says, uh, you know, I, Pastor, I started coming to the church and i hear what you say i won't say i'm born again yet i won't say i you know give a pass mark to everything you say pastor you know you're a peculiar man you know there are things you say that you know other pastors don't say but in any case i've been coming to the church and they say they need money and i'm surprised you know people give people give i i hope i suppose what they're giving is not enough and then we still hear announcements so between you and I, I have a lot of money. And I can write up this project just like that. One check, I cover everything. And uh, you say, you don't understand. This thing will cost us billions. It says, Pastor, I know. I know. I've done it for that church. I've done it for that church. And here I am now. And... I'm willing to give, even if it's two billion, three billion, he wants to put it on record. Out of the money I stole, I give deep and live three billion. And then there are people God provides through a thief, through a robber, through a rogue, through somebody stealing from other people. Or through people who are killing, killing others so they can make money. If you want to get to heaven, we want to build sanctuary. When the rapture takes place, we're not going to take that sanctuary with us to heaven. Beautiful building, good building. And if you soil your hand, if you destroy your life, if you backslide, I want to succeed as a pastor and you cannot succeed without money and they're coming they're bringing the money the money that closes your mouth and you cannot talk anymore against crime against corruption that money will take heaven from you we're near heaven we're near the coming of the Lord Nothing you know, will take heaven from me. I thought the church will say, Amen. Amen. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppression and shaketh his hands from holding of bribes. You're not even hold it. You're not even count it. You're not look at it. That stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. Those righteous people, they're the people that shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is far off. I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. And I'm reading here from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 35, reading from verse 8. And highway shall be there, and a way, 
and it shall be called the way of holiness look up here that verse had been there before Christ came many many years BC before Christ and deeper life only started a few years ago and the people when we talk about holiness oh they say that's deeper life doctrine as if the holiness had not been in the Bible before deeper life started and because they say that's deeper life doctrine they say and I'm not a member of deeper life and when there is a promise uh, of uh, prosperity they say that's the doctrine of they mention that church and they say I'm not a member there when we mention healing who do you say that is uh, you know peculiar to tell us born and I'm not a member of his congregation all the promises of God one by one they put in different compartments holiness in this compartment faith in that compartment healing in that compartment deliverance in that compartment prosperity in that compartment and because they don't belong to any of those compartments they miss out and they do not have the promises of God fulfilled in their lives the whole Bible is written for every one of us I didn't hear you. Amen. Amen. And highway shall be there. And a way. That way shall be called the way of holiness. Look at verse 8. The unclean shall not pass over it. The unclean shall not pass over it. What does that mean? I see at chapter 64. I'm reading from verse 6. I say, chapter 64, I'm reading here from verse 6. In verse 6, I say, chapter 64, look at what it says in verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing. Everybody, if you're not saved, you might profess that you know you're a good man, you're a good woman, you're good natured, you you know you help everybody. We all are as an unclean thing, and the unclean shall not pass over it. That way of holiness that leads to heaven. If you are not saved, whatever religion you have, whatever denomination you belong to, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness righteousnesses as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf our iniquities like the wind has taken us that's what it means when it says the unclean shall not pass over it Ephesians chapter 5 Ephesians chapter 5 here we're reading from verse 5 Ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 5 it says in verse 5 for this you know that no omonger no unclean person unclean person and you can tell an unclean person is not talking about the dress the language is dirty the proverbs they use they're dirty in the midst of men and women there's some words you shouldn't say if you're clean in the midst of a mixed congregation there's some words there's some sentences you should never compose you should never say if you're clean even when you are within the same gender a man with men there's some things you'll never say if it will bring unclean thoughts unclean feeling unclean fleshly drive you'll not say them if you're like that and you joke with unclean language 
I just say, I just want to make the company lively. You are not going to get to heaven that way. There shall be a highway and a way. And the way shall be called the way of holiness. And the unclean shall not pass over it. It says, no clean man, unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater and has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And then it says, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of what disobedience come back to Isaiah chapter 35. And I'm reading here from verse 8. And a highway shall be there. And a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for those the wayfaring men. Though fools shall not hear therein. No lion shall be there. No lion shall be there. No lion shall be on that highway of holiness. But we're talking about the way that gets to heaven. Is a lion trying to get to heaven? You don't understand. Ezekiel chapter 22. In Ezekiel chapter 22, we're looking at verse 25. Ezekiel chapter 22 from verse 25. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. It's talking about prophets here, preachers here. It's talking about men. It said these prophets, they're like roaring lion ravening of prey they have devoured souls they have crushed souls you know the pity sometimes in churches there is somebody is quick tempered can be very angry and when he's angry he can throw anything a javelin like Saul. He can even slap somebody if he's really, really angry. He can destroy something you know, that doesn't belong to him. He's angry. And anger is short madness. And that man or that woman may be in the congregation, but very, very significant. Is able to do this. It's a man of many talents, a man of many skills. And the leadership in that church, they're not thinking about his soul. They're not thinking about where will he spend eternity. All they are thinking about is, yes, we know. That, that, that's, that's his second nature. Anger, that's his nature. He can be brutal when he's angry destructive when he's angry but you know how can we remove him from there how can we handle there how can we tell him to go and pray because if you tell him to go and pray our work will not make progress he is the god of that church god cannot give them progress be without that lion God cannot give them progress without that person that is destroying souls. You see, we need to understand if we love the people, it's selfish for you to get the services of people and for you to allow people to give all their money, all their strength, all their skill, everything they've got. Take that away from them when you know in your heart of hearts, if they die in this condition, they cannot get to heaven. But selfishly, we want to get their skill, we want to milk them out until every good thing they have, we have taken everything. But a lion shall not pass over it. 
the way of holiness is the way that leads to heaven don't cheat people and don't steal from people they've got their skill they've gone to university they've gone to institutions and they have labored they have studied more to have their skill don't, don't, don't be jealous of that skill and say you must use it in a church here. Yeah? If they're not saved, if they're not children of God, don't take from them what they have and they deceive themselves. They're going to heaven. Skills do not take us to heaven. Ability does not take us to heaven. I can do this, I can do that. I sacrifice money, I give money. Cannot take us to heaven. It is holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Let us understand that and stand for the word of God. If we lose their money, have we lost anything? No. And if we lose their friendship, have we lost anything? No. I'd rather lose familiarity with an unholy person and keep that person with me and be deceiving him that is going to heaven because he's giving this or giving that. God shall supply all our need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. If you have riches and you have holiness, praise the Lord. And even then, even then, we're not going to come to you and say you have holiness and we know you have money give us this give us this what if you backslide what if you compromise and your money is in our pocket keep your money and don't even tell us you're giving us if you want to give give it to god so that you'll understand we're not placing you on any kind of high tower where only the holy people should belong to i'm reading that verse 25 again there is a conspiracy of our prophets in the midst thereof like a roaring lion ravening the prey they have devoured souls they have taken the treasure and precious things and they have made her many widows in the midst thereof uh, you know that you know people can die of hypertension people can die of you know sorrow of heart there are people that might say they have this and they have that and what they're doing to families can bring so much sorrow in the heart of some members of those families that they die before their time and some of the people that act anyhow without understanding how people feel and what affects people they are the instrument of death in those families and yet they are there i am this i am that as we have learned let jesus increase and i tell me i pray we'll do that in jesus name I look at second corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 second corinthians chapter 7 i read from verse 1 having therefore these promises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves i cannot come and cleanse you i can only show you that's dirty that's unclean there's a spot there, there's a stain there, there's a blame there, and then you are the one that will go to the cross under the dripping blood of the Lamb, and you wash in that Lamb. And it says, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh, filthiness of the spirit, perfecting, what are you perfecting? I say, what are you perfecting? Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Point number three, the fixed direction of hope towards heaven. If there's any man who can pitch you, it's a man that knows that this is the way, and yet it's wobbling. 
They said the way, and yet is not standing. If there's any man to pity, it's a man that knows too much in the head, but the heart is virtually empty. But a person that says, yes, this I know, follow peace with all men, and I know that that is the only way to get to heaven, and I'm going to do it. And you fix your mind on that noise coming from there noise coming from there distraction coming from everywhere and you fix your focus on heaven i remember when i came to know the lord jesus christ in the place i was going uh, in the white garment church you know everybody if they didn't see me they'd be looking for me i was their drummer and when we begin to beat the drum it's like we thought we were at the top of the world and then to interpret dreams and you know people will come to me i have this dream interpret for me i have that dream interpret for me and uh, you know many many things will fast monday wednesday friday every week we continue fasting like that and and we thought we were at the top of religion, but I didn't know being born again. But eventually I heard, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And uh, you know, at first I didn't understand. I felt the place was so cool, the place was so quiet. There's no jumping, you know, the preacher preaching, so he did not rise up there and say, No, says the Lord. And then after that one finishes, and then the preacher is preaching, another one will start a chorus and a song, and then the preacher will finish, uh, will stop, and then we'll finish with we'll, we'll, we'll that chorus, and then he's preaching again, and then somebody comes on me, and then I put my hand on that drum, and he has to stop the preaching, and then we're drumming. But when I came to this other place, they just preached the word of God and he found me out and I came and I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ I felt clean on the on the inside I knew that this is different and then I made up my mind I will not go back to that other place again I was uh, you know going with a particular man to that other place and while I'll be, be doing the drumming he will you know be lost in the spirit and begin to say some things out and then eventually when I said now I've made up my mind my eyes are fixed my mind settled that this is the real thing I've been looking for, but I didn't know that man that was going, were going together to that other place. If I said good morning, he will not answer. He was keeping malice just because I said I found the way of salvation. I didn't allow that to stop me. I said this one I've got, nothing will take it away from me. And I'm talking about you there, what you have got. Nothing will take away from you in Jesus' name. And, you know, my drum-beating friends came to me and said, William, what's the matter? I said, I got something I never got before. It's called salvation. There's the joy of salvation in my heart. And this one, I'll never leave. And the prophet that used to, you know, tell me if you are going to have this, this is what you do. If you are going to have this, this is what you do. And they all spoke and I said, this one I have found. My mind is fixed and I'm going to remain this way until I die. Well, more than 50 years now gone, I'm still there. My heart is fixed. I said my heart is fixed. You are not going to allow your getting to heaven to depend on somebody's smile at you, somebody's frown at you, somebody criticizing you, somebody accepting you, somebody rejecting you. If you are going to get to heaven, you have to be fixed up in your mind. Psalm 57. In Psalm 57, I'm reading here from verse 7. Psalm 57, verse 7. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I lost many things. I lost many friends. I lost many connections. I lost quite a lot of things. And I had to sever myself from that kind of spirit that will come upon us in that place without salvation. 
I said, no, it cannot be. My heart is fixed to God. My heart is fixed. I'm looking at Psalm 108, Psalm 108. In Psalm 108, I'm reading here from verse 1. Oh God, my heart is fixed. He said it before, he's saying that again. Oh God, my heart is fixed. We're coming to Psalm 112. Psalm 112, I'm reading from verse 7. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Look up here for a moment. In the city where I was living, the church that introduced salvation to me, that church was not there. I had to travel out every Sunday in the morning and stay there until the evening service and at night come back all alone by myself. And the people in that church far away did not say they want to follow me up and come to the city where I was. I was going. Nobody came to me and said, hey, will you keep coming? I knew I must keep coming. Nobody came to me and said, what do you think about this? And they tried to convince me. Nobody even promised me anything. I didn't know there was anything to be had. Eh, he will heal you. He will provide for you. He will get a job for you. You are a young man now. You know, if you keep coming, you'll have a wife. You'll have children. They didn't tell me anything like that at all. No follow-up at all. But my mind, my heart was fixed. And if you're a child of God, and you know that this is the way, the way to heaven, whether people come to check you up on you or not, you are the one to be asking for where is the church, what is the place, and your heart is so fixed, you'll be there in Jesus' name. I'm reading again from that chapter 1, 1, 2, 1, 12, verse 7. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Your heart is fixed. I said your heart is fixed. I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7. The Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. I set my face as a, as a flint, and I know that that is the way to heaven, the way of holiness, and nothing, nothing will turn me around. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 51. Luke chapter 9, and I'm reading from verse 51. Your heart is fixed. I said your heart is fixed. I'm looking at this, chapter 9, verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come, that he should be received up, received up into heaven, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Steadfastly, steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, reading from verse 24. Acts, chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me. Nothing will move you. Nothing will shake you. Nothing will disturb you. Anything happening, news coming from there, news coming from there, Nothing will shake you. And after I became a Christian, that challenge continued. I gave my life to the Lord. And now I became somebody that the sinners did not understand me. Church people did not understand me. My own family people did not understand me. And then our family powerful family powerful family powerful 
And when the family said, this is what every member of the family will do, you must. That's the way they thought about it. And now, deeper life started. And during Christmas period, we have to be at the retreat. I was the one that set the date. I was the one that called the people. My family at home, some of them I'll be hearing now, because some of them eventually have come, and they are still living near, near our place. They will always search the family meeting at the time of the retreat. And guess what? I'm always at the retreat. From the time the retreat started until this one, I've always been there. And I will always be there. Sometimes my voice is low, I will be there. Sometimes my voice is high, I will be there. Whatever is happening, I must be there. And then my mother was still alive. My mother would be in that meeting. At that time, she wasn't born again. She was coming to a retreat. Later, she became born again. But the man, powerful there, would stand my mother up and say, where is your son? Go and fetch him. If he is not here, this will happen, that will happen. And my mother will cry to me and say, my son, the whole family is against me because you are not there. I said I cannot be there. I've made my choice. I am going to heaven. Anybody that wants to come will come and join me. I will not go and join them. My mind was set and my face fixed. I'm passing it on to you. You will have that mindset. But you know now, things have changed. The king of our place came to our retreat sometimes just to talk to me. Because I will not come, he had to come. And all the members of our city, they now came and they said, we know this is of God. What if I change at the times when things were tall? You will not change. When you fix up your mind and you know that this is where you are going and you know that this heaven, if anybody gets to heaven at all, you must get to heaven. That's why you say, well, Paul the Apostle, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course of joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And if you fix your mind like that, a final day will come, you will see heaven. You will get to heaven. Acts chapter 7, verse 55. But he, Stephen, but he, Stephen, but he, this man nobody understood, around them there, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, looked up steadfastly into heaven, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens open. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Not too long, the people there cried out and they stoned him. He didn't even feel the pain of the stone. Verse 59, he called upon God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He went to heaven. He went to heaven. He went to heaven. Your time is coming. Where will you be in eternity? 
I say, where will you be in eternity? Rise up and tell the Lord. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. Hypocrisy will not make it. Wickedness will not make it. Vacillating, sometimes up, sometimes down, will not make it. Make up your mind. Lord, I want to be in heaven. Open your mouth and pray. What's making you doubt? Settle it. What's making you waver? Settle it. What's deceiving you? I give this, I give that. I'm very important in the assembly. If I'm not there, nothing will move. Uh huh. That's what takes, takes you to heaven. Where will you spend eternity? Make up your mind and fix up your mind. Salvation is a personal thing. Decision. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though friends suppose me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Sometimes physically tired, weary, because of the pressure of the rough road, all the same. No turning back, no turning back. Trials come. Families draw or drive. All the same, no turning back, no turning back. Friends who are believers the same time with you, they decide to draw back. They decide to give up. Whatever others do, whatever others don't do, no turning back, no turning back. Some of the people you know become rich either in the righteous way or in an unrighteous way. And you are still your normal self. You only have moderate earnings, income. You don't know what they are doing. All the same. No turning back. No turning back. Sometimes they ask you questions. Okay, you say you are following the Lord. How about this? How about that? Where is the God? You say you are serving. Why haven't you got this? Why haven't you got that? All the same. No turning back. No turning back. Examine your heart, examine your life, not what we know about you, not what your friends, family members know about you, what does God know about you?
settle whatever needs to be settled be washed and be cleansed in the blood of the lamb and then make up your mind and set your face as a fleet that nothing will shake you nothing will move you and highway shall be there and away it shall be called the way of holiness the unclean shall not pass over it it shall be for the wayfaring men the fools shall not err therein no lion shall be there furious temper anger indignation so angry you destroy what you ought to preserve no lion shall be there nor any ravenous beast it shall not be found there but it shall be for the ransomed saved transformed child of god and they shall come with joy and singing and sorrow and sign shall vanish away